Hello, everybody. How is everybody doing? Okay. We hope. We hope so. Um, so today is our, can you guess which week? You know what the class is? Humanities 101, Western Civilization. Um, so we're going to be talking about the Enlightenment today, major figures of the Enlightenment, and then end off with the um, Industrial Revolution, and we should be done for the quarter, okay, which is exciting, right? Next week will be the final exam, it will be the final exam, so. This is for this class is scheduled for today, Monday, the fifth of uh, I'm sorry, the fifth, the fifteenth of June. Okay, and the final will be on the twenty second. Right. Okay. So um, I guess without further ado, uh, let me start getting into the uh, PowerPoint lecture for you. Okay, and hopefully it will be of some interest. Okay, all right. I'm gonna have to go back here. Okay, so again, like I said, Humanities 101, HUM 101, that's the course code. And the class is the Civilization of the West. And we're at the University, International University of the East. Pretty exciting, and I'm still in Jejudo up here, and we are in week nine, okay? All right. So like I said, we're gonna be talking about the enlightenment. I'm trying to push myself up in the corner, and away, so you concentrate on the reading material. Yes. Okay, major thinkers of the enlightenment. The philosoph philosophs of the Enlightenment were such a large and varied group that this book can only cover a few of the most prominent. Prominent being the most famous or the most important. So that's what they're going to try to do here. And a varied, uh, yeah, everybody knows the word variety when you go to a, uh, a brunch or a buffet, but here we mean a varied group of thinkers. So here we go, the first one. Montesquieu. Yes, Montesquieu. Charles Louis Secondat, Baron de Montesquieu, was born in 1689 in the Gironde region of southwestern France. His two most famous works are the Persian Letters, 1721, and Le Esprit de Loi, or the Spirit of Laws, 1748, so 27 years later, which is quite an accomplishment since during those times, um, I think the average age of most people was in their 40s, so this person was, was having a pretty long life. Uh, many scholars consider the Persian letters as the book that began the Enlightenment. It is in the form of a collection of letters written by two fictional, which means not real, Persian travelers in Europe. The travelers observe and comment on French society, government, and customs, and also discuss conditions at the Persian court they have left behind. Montesquieu used this format to make some pointed, well, not necessarily point, a sharp point, but to illustrate a point, say, look at this point. Although veiled, veiled means something covered when we wear a veil. Criticisms of the despotism that prevailed at this time in France. So a despot is an old word for someone like Kim Jong-un or a dictator. So, uh, what they mean by veiled here is a lot of times you have to write a story. 
people just think it's a story, but uh, for educated people, they know they're actually uh, making fun or pointing out the bad points of the government. We can't, there's no freedom to just say, hey, we have a bad government here. So he makes a story. People don't realize, uh, regular folks, what he's really referring to. Uh, he scoffed at the vanity, so he disliked and made fun of the vanity, and vanity is, uh, a lot of women are accused of vanity, where, let's say, you know, you, people think the woman is beautiful, but she herself holds herself at an even higher level of beauty, she thinks. You think she's a 10, and she thinks she's a 20. So she has a vanity and pride that the hereditary nobles took in their possession. So again, hereditary means something you gained from your family in the past. Noting that it came not from intelligence or virtue, but from accident of birth. So that's what we say people are born uh, accidentally with a gold or silver spoon in their mouth. So a lot of times they don't earn the positions that are just given to them. That's why he calls it uh, the accident of birth. Montesquieu published the Persian letters, and now we're at the bottom of the page there. So you all know what that means. I'm gonna have to go to the, to the white board, okay. To the white board. Let me get that pencil. Okay, so I'll be kind, a short half page, so only one question. But again, I still have my left hand uh, injured, so I'm doing it one-handed, so please be patient. See, these capitals, sometimes they do not want to go away. They're stubborn. They want attention. I have to stay on top of them. Oops, what happened there? Oh, see, they got angry because I didn't, I erased it. Okay, now it's being stubborn. So what I'll do is, uh, I guess I'll have to start from scratch. Do it again. Let me get that pencil for then which it steals my pencil. And hopefully the um, capitals won't want more revenge. Okay. okay. There we go. So far, so good. Like I said, only one hand here. Uh, oops. Okay. See, going downhill. I got to be vigilant. I oh. Okay, I made it through. Wow, give me a donut. Uh, what did Montesquieu write that many consider started the Enlightenment? So he wrote a certain book that after the population read this, many feel this is what started the Enlightenment. So just give me the name of that book, okay? So I'll give you a minute to write that down. Let me mark what we've done so far. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm pretty sure you have that, right? Pamela Titan. So again, what did Montesquieu write that many consider started the Enlightenment? Okay, all right. Back to the eraser. All right, now I gotta go back to the delicious uh, PowerPoint lecture. Okay, so we finished at the bottom with the Persian letters. I've marked off what we've done, so let me proceed. Put us in the next spot. Okay, anonymously in the Netherlands, a common course for authors to pursue at that time if they thought their ideas would stir up trouble with the authorities. This book was a great success, going through several editions in a single year. Okay, so we have that big first word up in the left-hand corner, page 110, as you can see. Anonymously, which means you do not put your name on the book. Because if he had, the government probably would have chased him to put him in jail. So when you write something anonymously, nobody knows who wrote that book, right? So you have to have a lot of uh, protection at times if you're going to criticize a king or a government. Okay. Okay, and stir of trouble just means to make trouble. It's like you had a pot of trouble and you had a big spoon. Okay. Continuing, the spirit of laws is a work of serious political theory. Unlike Persian letters, it does not make its points under the guise of fiction. Okay, so here we go. Guise is like from the word disguise, like fiction. So like I told you before, you write a story about a, a really mean giant that kills a lot of people but you're really, it's a disguise and it's fiction, but you're really talking about, again, the king or the despot that's really making people struggle, right? But this one, the spirit of laws, it makes its point not under the guise of fiction. So this is actually not fiction, real truth. This was the first book to advocate a balanced government made of different branches, executive, Legislative, legislative and judicial, each of which had some power over the other. So like if you take my US history class, you find out about checks and balances. So as I've explained in that class, uh, we have checks and balances here. So if President Trump decides he wants to attack some country and start war, even though he's the most powerful man in the country, he's the president, he cannot do it. We have checks and balances. Congress uh, has to okay it. Okay? But if you have someone like Kim Jong-un and he decides he wants to attack Japan or South Korea, God forbid, there's nobody that stops him and says, we have to discuss this. We have to think about it with the rest of the North Korean people. He just does whatever he wants. So there's no checks and balances there. Here they're trying to start the idea of doing this and break away from the uh, early European kings, which were like a Kim Jong-un or Fidel Castro or Joseph Stalin. Uh, so continuing, each of which had some power over the others. That's good, checks and balances. Montesquieu believed this was the best way to avoid the autocracy. Again, auto means one, only one person with ultimate power that he felt was corrupt and harmful to society. The work also examined the roles of major social institutions, again, social, because people decide if they wanna go even to church, they're not forced. Uh, so such is the church, which lost no time placing it on the index of forbidden books, right? So this critique, this book's forbidden, it's garbage. It's criticizing, we don't want it. However, it was widely read and highly influential. Influential means making people understand and changing their minds. 50 years after the book's appearance, 
The government of the United States was organized along the lines suggested by Montesquieu. Like I said, that's all we have here. Checks and balances. So no one has complete ultimate power. Okay. Next, we proceed with Voltaire. Born in Paris in 1694, Francois Marie Arouet was educated by the Jesuits and determined early on to pursue a career in writing. Around 1718, he coined the pen name Voltaire, by which he was known for the rest of his long and productive life. So even this is a, a attempt of protection. You don't write under your name, Francois Marie Arouet. You write under the pen name, which is also a disguise. Voltaire. Okay, so let's get further into Voltaire here. All right. One of Voltaire's most important concerns was freedom of religion. During a three year stay in England in the 1720s, he observed what he considered an ideal society, one that supported its artists and men of letters while allowing its citizens to worship as they saw fit. By praising England enthusiastically in his Letters on England book, published 1733, Voltaire implied severe criticism of the very different conditions in France. So he was upset in his own country. It wasn't run like it was run here in England. As a consequence, the book was banned in his own country. Of course, they did not like the comparison, the criticism. So the government banned it. Voltaire was twice imprisoned, Jesus, in Bastille. Bastille is the most famous uh, old time French prison. If you went there, it's pretty bad. So he was imprisoned two times in Bastille for his writings. After the second prison term, he moved to the Swiss border area where it would be easy to flee or escape if the state pursued him in the future. Don't write any more books, they probably won't pursue you, but if you continue to criticize, you're probably gonna get trouble. So pretty good there, uh, not a lot for me to go through there. Uh, Voltaire published throughout his lifetime, both fiction and nonfiction. So fiction being stories, made up things, in nonfiction, which is truth, and kept a volumin uh, voluminous, voluminous correspondence. Voluminous means many, many editions of correspondence with all the great thinkers of his age. So how I can put that in modern terms, it's like if you have 100 Facebook friends. You know, He had so many uh, great thinkers that he wrote to, but then you had to actually write a letter. His best known work is the short novel, Candide, published in 1759, which lampoons, lampoons means to make fun of, many of the worst aspects of European society. So now he's attacking not only France, but the other major parts of uh, European society, other countries, government, military life, and religion. The novel concludes that one must cultivate one's garden. One must grow one's own garden. In other words, what is most important is to use one's intellectual and philosophical skills to solve real practical problems in a realistic and practical way. So you see that nice uh, repetition of practical, practical. Uh, practical means you do something and it's it's like saying common sense you know not a not a doing something in a wild way or a way that might be overly expensive to you right do it in a simple way that doesn't cost a lot of money and as long as the situation uh, is fixed, you should be okay. That's a practical way of looking at it. Uh, 
uh, again, you know, I can give you a silly uh, example, right? Let's say you have a girlfriend and uh, she wants to go to Chosun Galbi five nights a week. Except if you take her to Chosun Galbi five nights a week, you're going to be bankrupt by the end of the week. Your paycheck will be gone. So that's not a practical way of doing things because then she wants to go other places on the weekend. So if you tell her, well, we can go to Denny's and other places during the week, and then I will have money for the weekend where I can take you to Chosun Galbi and some place in Beverly Hills if you want. And that would be more practical for me. Hopefully she stays around, but yeah. If you spend too much during the week, don't have enough money for rent or bills, that is not a practical solution, okay? And then reading on the, the bottom of the page, Voltaire lived to the great age of 84. See, I mean, these guys, I don't know why, because they're great thinkers. When many people are like, hey, I lived till 45, that was a good life. I don't know, is it brain power? Uh, he lived to 84, not quite long enough to witness the French Revolution, but long enough to see himself crowned as the elder statesman of the Enlightenment, which means the oldest guy of the Enlightenment. So we've come to the bottom of this page, which would be 110. So it's uh, question time again. Whiteboard do. Pencil. Okay, again, one handed Louie here. Okay, what was one of Voltaire's most important concerns, right? An important thing that he was concerned about. Was it that he wanted to marry a bikini model? Was that one of his most important concerns? Uh, was it that he wanted to win the lotto? And, uh, I don't think they had the lot of that. And uh, retire a millionaire or something else, something more philosophical. Okay. So let me write the next one. Oh, I still have the pencil. Oh, I didn't put a number up here. Uh oh, bad boy. So this one is a three. Okay. I'll see if I can put a two up there in a second. See these. Uh, this uh, computer here is playing games with me. It likes to trick me. But I will not lose my temper. I'm smarter than the, than the computer. Okay, what did his book Candide talk about? Okay, it talked about something. Now let me see if I can put a number up here. Oh, that's not good. Okay, I guess it doesn't want. So you guys know that's two. So again, I'll give you a minute to write those down. Let me mark off that we've done the next page, which would be 110. So 
so we can step along in four. Okay. So, hey, did you write those down with your uh, shingo there? Okay. All right. Yeah, little chum chum. Oh, myself. Hmm. I got that from Mr. Hong. Okay, so I guess I should uh, erase these. We've had plenty of time. Go to the eraser. So again, this would be number two. What was one of Voltaire's most important concerns? To retire in Hawaii, maybe? Next one, what did his book Candy talk about? Did it talk about Korean baseball, like the Wyverns or the LG Twins or the Tucson Bears. I used to play for the Bears because I'm a bear. I have bear blood. So what did his book talk about? Okay. Back to that shocking PowerPoint lecture. Okay, so we finished off at the bottom here where it says enlightenment. So let me proceed. On to the next person. Okay. Oops, something got into my eye. All right. I think it's a hot noon call. Okay. All right. So we're going to go to uh, Rousseau. So Jean Jacques Rousseau, born in 1712 in Geneva, Switzerland, was in many ways the odd man out amongst the philosophers. So I want to make sure you understand that odd man out. Let's say, um, you know, because we know the word odd is different, right? But we're just trying to say he's different amongst the group for a certain reason. So uh, let's say I moved to Korea and I had some friends and uh, we made a band like BTS. So he don't start laughing at me. Okay. So if my three other guys were Korean and then we got famous, we're like, we're like the BTS Adashis, right? Um, I would be the odd man out because I'm not actually Korean. They'd say, hey, this guy's a foreign guy. Right, so that's all that means. So there's different reasons for being the odd man out. Uh, as his thinking developed over time, he quarreled. Quarrel means to fight. British people still use this word. Uh, he quarreled violently with almost all of them. Uh oh, concentrating on man's emotional side rather than his reasoning powers. Rousseau believed passionately in the importance of each person as a unique individual. Also sounds like what came over to the United States, what we borrowed. Okay, that's not the police after me. I think they're after Titan. So Titan, you better hide. Um, his works insist. Wow, I think they're after Ken now. Yeah, and Caroline. His works insist that the emotional makeup of a person is just as important as the intellectual. Therefore, he has often been considered the father of the romantic movement in the arts. Do we have any romantic men in here? Only me? How about romantic women? Inky is angry and says no. Okay, thank you, Inky. I think tall might be romantic. Uh, in the social contract published in 1762, Rousseau described his ideal society. He believed that social structure was inherently evil, which means from the beginning, born evil, because as he could see for himself, it created false ideas of inequality. So meaning this guy's not rich, that guy's poor, but he hated social structure. He saw people born into one social rank and thus condemned to stay in it regardless of national merits or faults. Uh, because at that time, if you were born in a poor social rank, there's really no way to get out of it unless maybe you're a very beautiful woman and you married a rich guy or a uh, noble fellow. Rousseau believed that without an imposed, which means put on you, social structure, human beings would follow their nature and would relate to one another in benevolence. Benevolence means like 
good, goodness, brotherhood, right? Rather than self-interest. So he didn't like self-interest. The notion or the idea of the noble savage seemed ludicrous to many of the other philosophers or philosophers who believed that education was the key to a better society. So you can make your own conclusion there. Stay basic and you think, see here, like it says here, uh, benevolence and rather than their self-interest. Not everybody thinks of benevolence. Some people think of crime. So you don't need a social structure to do crime. Rich people do it and poor. So I think he was a little off base there, a little too much fantasy. And that the other people believe that education was the key. And if you're educated not to do bad things, that's quite helpful, yes? If you're not, then What's to feel guilty about? Okay, so that is Rousseau. We have to move on to Diderot. Okay, tout de suite. All right, Diderot. Denise Diderot was born in 1713 in the town of Langres in northeastern France. Do you like my French accent? Okay, like Voltaire. He received a good education under the Jesuits. He was able to turn his hand to any number of intellectual tasks, including editing, translating, and writing both fiction and nonfiction. Diderot's most important contribution to the legacy of the, uh, or did I, where did I lose my place? Yeah, to the legacy of the Enlightenment is the Encyclopedia. The project came about when he accepted a commission to translate Chambert's Cyclopedia into French. Diderot decided to publish his own encyclopedia, which grew over time to 17 volumes of text. Wow. Published between 1751 and 1765, 14 years. And 11 volumes of engraved illustrations completed in 1773. Until 1758, mathematician Jean-Baptiste de Alembert worked with Diderot as co-editor when de Alembert withdrew, succumbing or falling to pressure from powerful vested interests, so powerful political people with money, who did not want to see the work published. Diderot carried on alone. As its name suggests, the Encyclopédie was an attempt to sum up all human knowledge in one place. It included articles by all the greatest thinkers and writers of the age, including Voltaire, Rousseau, Didier, and Temujin on a variety of topics, science, technology, crafts, mathematics, arts, religion, music, and history. The purpose of the Encyclopedia was to enlighten the ignorant, to provide ordinary people with information that everyone as a sentient or a live thinking being in the world should know. The philosophies believe strongly in the value of education. They saw ignorance as their enemy. They believed that educating the common people was one of the most basic and important ways to improve society. Okay. So um, I've gone down to the bottom of Didier. So it's um, time for me to ask questions. Okay. A board, pencil. Okay. Hey, what did Rousseau concentrate on? Did he, again, did he concentrate on Korean baseball? Did he concentrate on United States football? 
did he concentrate on the ladies like uh birdie b maybe likes to concentrate who knows if you read the lecture you'll know okay come on now don't get snappy that pencil doesn't want to come out So you see, I'm also sticking to only two questions. Isn't that nice and kind? So sweet. Teacher sweet. Hey, Diderot's book, Candide, was about what? What was it about? Was it about cooking recipes? How to make a delicious fried chicken? How to make good kimchi or salsa? What was Candide about? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to write those down. Again, Pamela, get away from the candy crush or Munk, Munk Bayar is always in the Candy Crush. So um, let me mark off that I've done these two. We've gone through 111. Okay. So uh, let me erase these then. What did Russell concentrate on? Peter Rose's book, Candy, was about what? Okay. Back to the lecture. So we went on down to the bottom of the row. And um, yeah. Oh, should I? No, okay. We'll skip. I'll throw one out. How about that? I'll skip that. I'll uh, throw it out. Not necessary, it's repetitive. So now we're on to the uh, Industrial Revolution, okay? Which means we have to be now on, and for me, uh, 135. Okay. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, 1750 through 1914, long time. The tale of modern European history can be seen as a series of revolutions. The Protestant Refor Reformation was truly a revolution in Christian worship. The scientific revolution gave birth to a completely new way of thinking about the universe. The French Revolution attempted to establish a government along the lines of enlightenment ideals. And the Industrial Revolution brought manufacturing into the modern era of mass production and consumption. Scientific revolution, of course, was a major prerequisite or something that goes before of the Industrial Revolution. It created a climate of fascination with mechanics, physics, and technology without which the engineering achievements of the Industrial Revolution could never have taken place. The Industrial Revolution began in Britain long before it developed on the European continent. This was due to a variety of factors, including Britain's stable government and society and its lack of direct involvement in the Napoleonic Wars. If you remember who Napoleon was, the guy with the hand inside his jacket. Uh, British engineers and inventors developed most of the technology that would make the Industrial Revolution possible. The Industrial Revolution arrived on the European continent around 1830. It took root first in the nations that already had the mercantile mindset and the natural resources to make it happen. As the 19th century rolled on, the nation states began altering and developing their banking systems, the source of finance that made industrial growth possible. In addition, governments soon saw from Britain's example that industrializing, they would make money. So again, no difficult vocab there at the bottom of the page. So quickly to the questions. Whiteboard, pencil. Okay, so this will be question seven. 
six, I threw out because I'm kind. Okay. Okay, where did the Industrial Revolution begin? Did it begin in Mexico? Did it begin in Japan? Or did it begin in China under Gao's great, great, great grandmother? Where did it begin? Okay, so I'm only gonna, again, stick with two here. Nothing more, oh, it does, it's getting angry, okay. Easy stuff, straightforward questions for you guys. Nothing, it's your last week. I don't want to torture you. So again, um, donations can be sent to my email, starting at a thousand dollars. And not thousand one, okay? Dollars. Me cook dollars, okay. Oops, don't want that. Okay, who developed the technology? What individuals from society uh, developed the technology for the industrial revolution? So I'll give you a few minutes there. Let me mark off the spacings. Don't wanna get ahead. I wonder if Ochi here is with me. No, I don't think, I don't know. I guess not this quarter. I miss Ochi here is a good guy. Okay, or maybe Rie, I don't, I don't know. I don't think Rie either, they took their vacation. Okay, so we're doing okay on writing those down. Okay. Get the eraser. Where did the Industrial Revolution begin? Okay, maybe it began in Batangas in the Philippines, my hometown, who knows? And then who developed the technology? Uh, maybe it was Temuchen who developed it, I don't know. He's been around a long time. All right, back to the delicious, okay. So we stopped off with the money in the bottom here. Let's proceed. Okay, on a vast scale, so vast is large. Therefore, they supported laws and regulations that favored the industrial revolution. Why not? They wanted it to make more money, so the laws favored them. The industrial revolution also saw a major change in society. For the first time, individual workers realized that they had the power to improve their own working conditions. This did not happen overnight, and it was met with fierce or strong resistance from the owners and managers. But slowly, the workers of Europe began to achieve recognition as a class with its own power and its own rights, which is very important. Okay, so these are objectives. You don't really have to get into these too well. It's just for your information. Identify the causes and effects of the Industrial Revolution. We're not going to do an essay. You're going to do fill-ins. Don't worry. Explain why the Industrial Revolution occurred first in Britain and only much later on the European continent. Identify the major figures of the area and match each person to his accomplishments in science and engineering. So I must continue. And we have a chapter timeline, which you don't have to worry about. 1733, John Kay invents the flying shuttle. 1763, James Watt improves the steam engine. 1764, James Hargreaves invents the spinning jenny, which spins yarn. 1769, Richard Arkwright invents the water frame. 1779, Samuel Crompton perfects the spinning mule. I don't, 
know if I want to get into that. 1787, Edmund Cartwright patents the steam-powered loom. Uh, 1825, railroad steam engine demonstrated. 1830, opening of Liverpool and Manchester Railway. German states established Zollverein, which I'm not German, so I don't know. 1833, British factory legislation. And the last, the Industrial Revolution begins in Britain. The Industrial Revolution began in Britain for two main reasons. One was its geographical makeup or location, and the other was its society. Okay. So we're at the bottom of that, and I have two questions there. That would be 136. Oops. What's going on here? It's being bad again. Uh oh. Will this help? Let me see. That's not good. Where's my screen? Hey, what happened to my. Honey, I need your help. There I am. It's trying to hide. Okay, so let me try that again. I have to go to the whiteboard, write my two questions, and then we'll deal with trying to get back on the correct um, lecture point. Okay, so this will be nine. One handed again. Okay, what was the change in society? Again, due to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, how, what was the change in society? How did it change the society? Okay, 10. Oh, see, it wants to be capitals again. It wants attention. Okay, last one for that page. Name two reasons why the Industrial Revolution started in England. Okay. Two reasons. So kind of like a question at the top and a question at the bottom. So let me give you a minute to write those two down. Let me mark off that we finished that page, which would be 136. Okay, let me go to the eraser. What was the change in society? Women all started wearing mini skirts. Well, who knows? Name two reasons why the Industrial Revolution started in England. Look at the PowerPoint. Okay, that's erased. That's done. Now, let me see if I can get back to where I was. So I should be okay right here.
some strange sounds coming from outside here at Jejugo. Trying to see if this will, it won't do what I want it to do. I was trying to go back to space. Okay. Previous, see? Previous is here, so that's where we ended. So we're fine. We're, we're fine. Okay. Uh, geography. The island of Great Britain was crisscrossed by a network of canals and rivers. Therefore, it was relatively cheap and easy to transport goods. The climate was temperate or mild, enough for travel, so not like a frozen landscape of Russia, and outdoor work year round, except in the very coldest weeks of winter, and there were no major geographical obstacles to transportation, such as giant mountain ranges or vast deserts like the Gobi, where Gao used to live in the Gobi Desert. Britain also had vast resources of coal, which was a main element of industry until late in the 20th century. Uh, coal was number one. Due to its geographical isolation from the European continent, Britain was largely unaffected by the Napoleonic Wars that consumed Europe from the end of the 8th century to 1815. So the body of water, the ocean, separated them from the mainland. Although Britain sent troops to the continent and Britain troops British troops played a major role in Napoleon's uh, defeat on the battlefield. France did not invade Britain, and its government and economy were not shaken up by the wars. So let me go to the bottom of the page. Society. From the glorious revolution in 1689 to the beginning of World War I in 1914, Britain was a very stable society. The constitutional monarchy functioned well, the banking system was prosperous, and the population was thrifty, which means they saved a lot, unlike our present generation. Many women who owned their own small businesses, taverns, taverns another name for bar, stores, mills, or farms, tended to invest their profits back into the businesses, smart. In addition, men who owned small businesses could vote, this connected the interests of industry to those of government. It's a nice chain there. Changes in farming. The British agricultural industry adopted Dutch methods of crop rotation. So they would change them. Fertilization is when you're using fertilizer. Some places use human fertilizer. Some places use animal. And diversification. The term crop rotation refers to planting a field with a different crop each year. For example, wheat the first year, rye the second, and potatoes the third. Each crop drew different nutrients and minerals from the soil, therefore rotating the crops allowed the soil to replenish its own resources. Diversification worked well for the same reason. Planting a variety of crops made the best possible use of the soil. It also cut down on poor harvests. If the wheat crop failed, for example, the potato crop might still thrive or succeed. In 1701, Jethro Tull perfected a seed drill that could be harnessed to a horse or is put on the horse's back. And as the horse walked down the field, the drill sold the seeds neatly and unitly. Okay, so at the bottom of the page here of uh, 137, so let me, it's question time. And you know what, I'll really be kind. I'll only ask one question. Okay. You get that pencil, this will be question 11. See, there goes the capitals again, sneaky.
Why was Britain not affected by the Napoleonic Wars? Okay, pretty straightforward. We talked about that. So let me mark that we finished 137. And we're on our last page. That's it. So let me erase that. I think we're going to have a very short reading. And uh, I think, again, only one question. And we're done for this week and the quarter. Okay. Okay, so we ended on the bottom with changes in farming. So let me take a peek here. Oh, yes, only half a page. We can cut through that quickly. Okay, uniformly. Previously, the farmer had to do his own sowing by walking down his rows and casting handfuls of seeds as he walked. This seed drill sped up the process and made it more efficient. Food production increased 300% over the course of the 18th century in Britain. Many people credit Tolls. Oh, Toll. Oh, okay, I didn't know you did this. It must be great grandfather seed drill and other pioneering agricultural ideas were the major part in this change. Well, Paul actually has British blood too. Mm. Probably because of the increase in food production, the British population would double between 1780 and 1851. So a lot of babies. Uh, because innovations in farming made large scale farms more economically profitable than small ones, Landowners began the process of enclosure, fencing in large tracts of privately owned land. Traditionally, the British had always permitted substance farming on any open field, regardless of who owned the land. This made it possible for villagers to raise crops and feed their families. With the changes in agricultural methods, however, landowners joined in the enclosure moment, thus consolidating or bringing together their fields for large-scale farming. Enclosure forced many villagers to move to the cities looking for work for wages or salary. This large-scale urban migration, of course, provided the factories with a steady supply of workers. In this way, agriculture played its own major role in the overall manufacturing economy. Okay. So on for our very last question and we are done. Because we've done the reading. Get that pencil. This will be question 12, our last one. Looks like a long one for me, short answer for you. It's a long one with one hand. Okay, last question of the quarter. What played a major role in the overall manufacturing economy? And we just answered that minutes ago, just a few minutes. Okay, so I'll give you a question to write that. Let me mark down that we've done the last page, which would be 138. Last question. And make sure you write it down. You can answer later if you like. So what played a major role in the overall manufacturing economy? So I'm going to go to the eraser and we are done for this quarter, except next week we have a test. So good luck. You guys are going to have to read your chapters, everything after the midterm. So the first four chapters, forget about them. They're done. You don't have to do them. But from five on, study your stuff. That's where the questions will come from, okay? So good luck with that. Let me grab the eraser. And uh, I shall see you next week. Okay, thank you much.
Okay, so I will be ending it now. Thank you.